Okay, so I'm Alyssa DeFilippo, Director of Parent Services at Matrix, and I have the pleasure of introducing Alexis Lynch, who is a, a California gal through and through, a, a Marin native, graduated from UCLA, and then attended law school at University of San Francisco, and then worked with Sterling Ross, who if anybody knows anything about special needs uh, trusts, he is kind of the grandfather of special needs trusts. And it was there that um, Alexis worked with um, family members uh, and families of people with developmental disabilities and discovered her passion, which uh, has become ensuring disabled family members are protected through conservatorships. Uh, Alexis has always been an active volunteer in the special needs community. She currently is the president uh, of our um, matrix board and also serves on the board of integrated community services, which if you have a teen or someone in middle school or certainly somebody in a transition program, um, you might want to just check out Integrated Community Services if you live in Marin. Okay, that's my little plug for them too. They're great. Um, so Alexis, you know, found her passion and is um, very happy to work in such a warm and supportive community. So Alexis, it's all yours. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. Oh, and I just want to say like conservatorships is like 80 85% of what I do every day, um, along with I do some special needs trusts. So I, I do this in, I've done this in nine, I think nine counties throughout the Bay Area. Um, and so I do this a lot. Um, and there are slight differences between counties sometimes. Conservatorship is a California wide system. So, you know, 98% of what we'll be discussing today will be the same uh, no matter what county you're in. But um, there are slight differences here and there, just little procedural things with the courts. Um, and I will try to call those out when those come up. Um, and I also want to say, and it's very important to understand, that you do not need to hire an attorney to put a conservatorship in place. Uh, the purpose of this um, workshop is to let you know how to do this, whether you're going to hire an attorney or whether you're going to do it yourself. Plenty, plenty of parents do it themselves. They represent themselves through this process. Uh, and so hopefully today, if that's your plan, you'll walk out of here knowing a lot more about how to do that and have a lot of resources to access for that. All right, so let's start with what is a conservatorship? Um, so conservatorship, when your child turns 18 in the state of California, they are legally considered an adult. And as an adult, that means that they are in charge of their own decisions and you lose legal authority to make decisions on their behalf. Uh, so what happens is if you have an individual that isn't able to provide for their own needs, um, can't make you know, appropriate decisions for their own health and safety and can't you know, live independently and get food that they need and buy their clothing and you know, all these types of things, as well as managing their own finances, when you have an adult that's not capable of those things without assistance, then you can go to court and request a conservatorship. And that puts someone in charge, that person in charge is called the conservator. And then the person who is receiving the help is called the conservatee. And we'll be, I'll be using those terms quite a bit today. Um, and so the judge basically appoints someone, a conservator, to be in charge of the care of the individual that needs, needs the assistance. Uh, there are two main types of conservatorships, general conservatorship and limited. Today we'll be discussing limited conservatorship because that is specific to an individual with a developmental disability. The law in California provides for a specific uh, conservatorship for individuals with developmental disabilities. So that is what we'll be covering today. Um, I generally explain a limited conservatorship to mean that the judge is going to limit the authorities that are granted to the conservator based on the needs of the individual. There are seven authorities that you can request, which we'll go over um, in shortly. And the court is gonna determine which of those decision-making authorities you as a conservator should have. Um, I also wanna say that I always refer to your child throughout this. And if anyone here is not um, an actual parent of a child or it's a different family member or something like that, apologies, but it's just easier for presentation purposes. Um, okay, so within the conservatorship, there's a conservatorship of the person and of the estate. Uh, when you're a conservator of the person, it means you're overseeing the personal care, um, such as where will they live? What type of medical treatment will they receive? Uh, what type of programming will they be enrolled in? Those types of day-to-day -day personal care decisions. 
A conservatorship of the estate will cover their finances, letting somebody manage their finances. Um, if the end, most, most of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, my clients have children who do not have assets in their name. Um, and they are receiving, for instance, SSI, right? And so if you're receiving SSI, you can't have more than $2,000 in countable resources. So most of the time, a, an estate conservatorship is not necessary. If your child is receiving public benefits, that does not need to be managed through a conservatorship. Um, and it's actually much easier administratively to keep it out of the conservatorship. So the way to manage the public benefits would be by signing up to be a representative payee. And that is going to be um, right here on the slide at the bottom of the slide. You'll see that there is a website about um, uh, social security payees. Um, and that is what you would do is you would sign up to uh, be the representative payee and manage the checks that come in every month um, from the public benefits checks. You'd manage those on behalf of your child. Um, so you can request just a conservatorship of the person. You do not have to request a conservatorship of the estate. And most of what we'll be discussing today will be conservatorship of the person information. Um, if you have a child that, you know, receives an inheritance, for instance, or has um, like a, a custodianship account. Um, a lot of times some you know, families set up a, a, a savings account specific to children, um, things like that. Those are the times when a conservatorship of the estate is probably necessary so that when they turn 18, you can ma still manage those assets. Uh, but for other kids who don't have any assets in their name, not necessary, okay? Let's see. So do you need a conservatorship and what are the alternatives? Um, this is unfortunately not a black and white question that I can just give an easy answer to. Uh, what I generally do is to give you some examples of individuals who have needed conservatorships, clients of mine that have needed assistance. Um, one such example, I had a client who had a 30 year old daughter who needed a simple cataract surgery so that she could see. Um, she had about the cognitive ability of a three-year-old or so. Uh, the hospital refused to perform the surgery because they said that she didn't have the ability to consent for herself to have the surgery, but they said the parents couldn't consent for her because she was an adult. So they were just stuck in limbo until they had a conservatorship in place that granted them authority to make medical decisions on her behalf. Okay, so that is an example of somebody who hit a roadblock and had to get a conservatorship in place. Medical needs is a very, very a common one. Um, technically speaking, now this isn't always how it happens in practice, but legally speaking, at the age of 18, an individual is supposed to have their medical records locked and is supposed to make all their own medical decisions themselves. Um, that means I've had parents say that when they take their child to the doctor, that they aren't supposed to be in the room during the examination. I've had a very extreme example of a client whose son uh, had a very, very, very severe uh, medical condition and had was in and out of the ER. And uh, it was very difficult for them to be in the ER room with him when he was under treatments. Um, and they faced extreme resistance by doctors. So these are examples of things that can happen. You know, this doesn't always happen by any means, so I don't wanna create fear, uh, but it is, you know, it does come up for some families. Medical needs is a common one. Um, another example are IEP meetings. Um, at the, you know, at the age of 18, uh, the, it is the child's right to make their own decisions regarding their schooling. Um, and so for you to be, and you know, they can agree to like have you be in the meeting and be there and be present. But as far as being able to be the decision maker regarding, uh, the, you know, the IEP and the plan that's put in place and being able to advocate for your child, um, you know, a lot of times parents need a conservatorship in place if they're facing some sort of uh, situation with the district. Um, so those are, you know, just a couple examples of, of things that have come up. So, you know, some parents like to put this in place and have it ready when the child turns 18. Other parents wait until something, some sort of roadblock comes up, and then they decide that, you know, they need to do this in order to uh, navigate and in order to advocate for their child's needs. Um, and I'll just give one last example that just came to mind. Um, a client who had a daughter who was living in an apartment um, with the help of support staff from a local agency. And the agency was not providing sufficient care. 
Um, she was just, there was very basic things that weren't being addressed. And the parents wanted to switch to a different agency, but the child was very resistant to change. And so she told the regional center that she wanted things to stay the same and she did not want to change agencies. Um, this was not to her, you know, this was not in her best interest because the treatment she was receiving was not adequate. So the parents were stuck and they couldn't switch agencies until they came and got a conservatorship and then they were able to navigate those choices for her. So those are some examples of uh, when conservatorship is necessary. As far as the alternatives, um, one such alternative is uh, having your child, if they are able to sign a legal document, and that's the big if here, if they are competent to sign a legal document, they can, for instance, sign a healthcare directive that puts you in charge of their decision-making regarding their medical needs. Um, that is an option. I will say I did have a client even th with that, even with the medical directive, I still had a client who faced resistance from doctors. So it's hard to know. It's just, it's whoever's on the receiving end, honestly, of the document that you hand over. Um, also release of information, um, you know, ROIs as they're commonly called with the regional center, with the schools, with agencies, you know, whoever it is that you're, you're working with, um, the child can sign the right for you to have access to their confidential information. It doesn't give you decision-making authority, but it at least gives you information regarding, um, you know, their records and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, you know, like I said, there are legal documents they can sign, um, but it's not always a perfect solution because it doesn't always, and with the exception of the um, medical directive, it doesn't necessarily give you decision-making authority. And further, um, it's pretty iffy whether or not the individual who signed, in, in some cases, whether or not the individual signing those documents it has capacity to sign a document of that magnitude. Um, and if they don't, and if they don't fully understand what they're signing, then it is legally void. Um, a lot of times doctors and, and, you know, some agencies will use it as a loophole in order to allow the parents to be able to, you know, participate. Um, but, you know, some don't because the kids, they, they say the kid doesn't have the legal right, legal capacity to do so. So, those, that's not a great, you know, not a perfect sale, you know, fail proof solution as an alternative, but it definitely can help in a lot of cases. And I do have clients that call me and I tell them not to do a conservatorship and to do this instead. So just depends on the situation. Okay. Hopefully you guys are along with me. It's so strange not having feedback and questions coming at me, but um, okay. So standard of proof. What do you have to prove to the court? You have to prove that the individual can't provide for their own needs for food, clothing, shelter, and physical health without assistance. Um, this is, I once had a client on the phone, I was explaining this to them and the dad said, well, my typical teen can't do this either, which I thought was funny, but it, the point being that it is a very broad standard. Uh, and, but this is what you would prove. Can your child go out and get their own apartment and go to the grocery store and, you know, go to the doctor's office and understand what medical treatment they need? And can they go buy themselves the clothing they need and dress appropriately and all those things? Can they do all of that in, independently or do they need assistance? And if they need assistance, then, you know, technically the standard of proof has been met. Um, that's for the, per, the conservatorship of the person. For a conservatorship of the estate, it's just that they can't manage their finances or that they're, you know, subject to undue influence or fraud, um, which is, a, you know, I had a client whose brother had a shady neighbor convince him to go to a bank and take out a $10,000 line of credit and then spend all the money with him. And it was, you know, that was a whole mess that they had to clean up. So you know, that they, he didn't actually have assets to manage, but they had to step in because he was subject to undue influence. So, and that was the grounds for a conservatorship in that case. Um, okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier. I said under limited conservatorship law, you can request seven powers. Um, these are the powers you can request. You don't have to request all seven. You can request just the ones that apply to you. Um, or you can ask for all seven. It just depends on your case. Um, so fixing the residence, which means deciding where they live, having access to their confidential records, um, entering into contracts on their behalf. And I always include the language and setting aside contracts 
because that is equally important. Um, you know, kids sign up for things online or whatever it is, and parents have to then contact the company and, and you know, end the subscription, those types of things. Um, consenting to medical treatment, we talked quite a bit about already, controlling their education. Um, and then these last two are very controversial, uh, controlling the social and sexual relationships and consenting or withholding consent to marriage. So those two are hot button topics, as you can imagine. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, regional centers, well, it kind of depends on which regional center you're with, depending on your county. Uh, but regional centers don't love grant having these powers granted. They believe in, you know, their clients being able to retain certain rights. Um, and so these are hot button topics and we'll talk about it a little bit more later on, uh, but I just wanna call those out. And again, you don't, if those aren't important to you, you don't need to request them. So, uh, and you can just request which ones from the seven are um, necessary in your case. <clears throat> All right, so this is important to understand. Um, conservatorships are not about giving you the authority to just step in, make all decisions, you know, have blanket control of your child and their life. The idea behind a conservatorship is giving you the authority when you need it to step in to advocate for your child and to protect them as needed. But what you really are supposed to be doing is promoting their maximum independence um, by, you know, helping them enroll in proper programming and being out in the community and engaging and developing the skills that they need and, you know, all of those things for, for promoting their maximum um, independence. And that's really, really important to understand. Courts do not want to see a conservator that is not fostering that independence. Um, and I've seen it in action. I've seen courts not want to grant conservatorships for parents who are not good allies that are not good, uh, you know, good partners with the regional center that are not good partners with the agencies that are providing care that are, you know, limiting the kids opportunities um, and limiting their uh, ability to be out in the community. Courts do not want to see that. So it's very important to understand a conservatorship is there when you need it because something is going wrong and you need to help fix it. But it's not this idea of just now you, you know, have, have, full control of everything. You, you can't think of it that way. Okay. Okay. So now we'll start getting into some nitty gritty of, you know, how, how this works, who acts as a conservator. Usually it's a family member. Um, you know, a friend could do it. Um, and there are professionals in the event that there is no, uh, family member or friend available. And yes, you can have co-conservators. You can have more than one. A lot of times parents act as co-conservators. Um, and that means that they share decision-making authority. Um, sometimes, yes, people have more than two, like more than parents. So sometimes a parent, the parents will want to have like a sibling of the individual as well. Um, for instance, I had a very elderly man contact me who was conservator of his daughter and he's very old and he was concerned about what would happen when something happens to him. And so he had his, another one of his sons appointed to be co-conservator with him so that when, you know, when he can no longer do it, then his son is already in place and it'll be a very smooth and easy transition. Um, so, you know, that is a possibility. There's a risk involved with having multiple conservators. And I do want to state that, you know, it's so hard to know the person who's on the receiving end of these documents, how they're going to take the documents. And if they see three names on there, for instance, and they say, well, I need all three of you here to make this decision, uh, then, you know, then you might be stuck. But I'd like to think that in today's day, you know, technology is r rampant now, even more than ever. And, you know, an easy phone call or FaceTime or, you know, Zoom session or whatever it is, could I would think could remedy that and have all, all conservators be able to make a decision. Um, but I just, I can't know for certain how this will play out in every scenario. So I just want to point that out. Um, okay. And a lot of people at this point ask about what will happen once they can no longer be conservator, if there is no conservator, co-conservator in place. And I will actually talk about that towards the end of the uh, towards the end of the presentation. So just hold on. Um, okay, so now we are going to talk about this is, um, I just realized if I'm sharing, I don't know if you can see. 
all of this. Um, now we're going to talk about this, the process about what we're going to go through in order to put a conservatorship in place. This is just a roadmap of what we'll be discussing in detail. You start by filing a petition. Um, then uh, the public defender's office is appointed, or I should say an attorney is appointed to represent the individual with the disability. Um, the regional center is appointed to participate in this process. Uh, you have to mail a notice of hearing to let certain people know that this hearing is going to take place. Uh, the individual who's being conserved has to be served with certain paperwork. A court investigator has to be involved and interview people. And all of this leads up to a hearing. And we're going to go through each of these steps and talk about what these look like. Okay. Oh, okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is actually called a capacity declaration. And I put this as first because without this capacity declaration, which has to be completed by a doctor, without this, you don't have a case that you can bring to court. Okay, so this is the very, I always say this is the first step for clients to figure out if they have a doctor who's going to support their request for conservatorship. So there is a specific form, and I'm going to show you uh, shortly where you find forms for conservatorships. There is a specific form called a capacity declaration that needs to be filled out by one of your child's treating doctors. By treating doctor, it just means someone who's licensed in California and is an MD, and that can be a general physician, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, as long as they are an MD in California, they can fill out this paperwork, okay? And what they are determining is they are determining two things. First, and not quite as important, is, is the individual able to attend the hearing? Um, you know, some individuals, well, right now we're in a strange time because people aren't actually going into the courthouse for hearings. All hearings are currently remote via phone, Zoom, whatever video capacity the court has signed up for. Um, so, but in the times of when we actually visited a courthouse, which someday we will again, um, you know, for some kids, it's very nerve wracking and anxiety producing to be, to participate in this process and go into court and sit in front of a judge. So if that's the case, then the doctor can state that they're unable to attend the hearing for medical reasons, such as anxiety, um, and they can state that on the form. The other thing and the more important thing that they are designating is whether the individual lacks capacity to give informed consent to medical treatment. Um, that is one of the things you're requesting is to be able to make medical decisions on their behalf. So you need to have a medical professional that states that they, this, the individual is not able to make these medical decisions themselves. Okay. So it's a, it's a standard form. It, um, has a, it has a scale of, um, of impairments, you, uh, cognitive abilities, the doctor marks somewhere between no impairment to severe impairment, and they gauge the impairment level in these various cognitive, cognitive abilities. And then at the end, they check a box and they have to check lacks capacity or has capacity. And you need a doctor that's gonna support your case by checking lacks capacity. All right, so I always tell clients that the first thing they do is that their doctor is going to fill out this form for them. Okay, so that is the first thing I always tell people. Now is the part about the rest of the paperwork and getting your petition in order. So first things first, um, you are going to put together a lot of paperwork and I'll get to that in a moment, but where do you even do this and how does this work? Well, in your local court and you want to do this in the county where the disabled individual lives. It's not where you live. If you live in a different county, you are doing it where the individual lives. Okay, that's the county that's going to oversee the conservatorship. And you're going to do it in the at the courthouse in the probate department. Okay, when you walk in any courthouse and the filing room, there's going to be, you know, family, family, probate, civil, like there's all these, you know, different windows and it's the probate the department that's going to handle your case. Um, when do you do this? So, like I said, you know, technically a conservatorship um, is, a, is something for somebody 18 and over because it's for an adult. So your choices are you can do it leading up to the 18th birthday so that the hearing is, you know, right before the 18th birthday and, and the conservatorship will go into place on the 18th birthday. Or a lot of people don't do it until something comes up, um, you know, so you can do it at any point in their life doesn't have to be when they're 18. So um, it's just up to you. As far as, you know, timing, let's, I get this question a lot. 
if you want to have it in place for the 18th birthday, when should you start this process? It completely depends on the county. Like Sonoma County is incredibly fast and efficient. You'll get a hearing usually in Sonoma six weeks after you have filed your paperwork. Um, but Alameda, for instance, I just filed a case a week ago and our hearing is in February. So it, it depends on the county um, and how long, you know, how long out their hearings are set. Um, and it also depends on how long, if you're going to do this yourself, how long it's going to take you to get your paperwork together so that it's ready to be filed. Or if you're working with an attorney, you'll want to ask the attorney how much lead time they need. Um, okay. So, um, and you know, courts don't want to see these cases, like when the kids, you know, turning 17, they want to see, they want this hearing to take place close to the 18th birthday. Um, and same with the regional center. So that's important to know. Don't, you can't do this too far in advance. Um, and what is the cost? So just to file a petition is a $435 cost. Um, it's actually in some counties is 465 because they tack on an additional $30 fee. Um, but there is a way to get your fees waived and I'll discuss that shortly, okay? All right, so this is kind of a scary slide because it shows all the documents that are necessary for your case. Um, I'm not gonna, I can't sit here and go through each form in detail because we would be here all day, but I wanna give you information about where these forms are located and how you can access them. So there is a database online, everything's online for California um, for these specific court forms. And what I have done is, first of all, if you scroll down to the bottom down here, it says all documents can be found at, and that's the site where you would go you are going to go to that site and find the probate forms. And within the probate forms, you're gonna look for guardianships and conservatorship forms. And it's gonna take you out to a big, spit you out to a big database of forms. And what I've done is I've given you the titles of the forms and their numbers. And it's usually easier to find them by their numbers, okay? Um, before I go through this, I also wanna say that um, you, if you, you want to check with your local court because every local court has their own forms as well. And it's usually not more than one or two. It's not like a huge amount or anything, but that is important to know. Um, okay, so petition. The first one is your petition where you're requesting, you know, I want to be conservator of Joey, okay? Um, and the second one is confidential supplemental information. That's a confidential form. And so that's where you can put lots of nitty gritty information about your child that you wouldn't necessarily wanna have you know, in the petition. Um, confidential conservator screening form. This is important because you need to be screened to be a conservator. The court needs to know that you don't have a criminal background and you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, they are going to check with you um, they're going to run a background check on you. And so that's what that form is for, for you to give information as needed. Um, citation, we'll talk about notice of hearing, we'll talk about, we've already talked about the capacity declaration, that's the doctor's form. Um, then there's an order which the judge would sign at the hearing if this go, if they grant your request. So you are in charge of preparing the order that this the judge is going to sign. And then letters of conservatorship, that's the document that you're gonna to show to everybody once you're done with this. And so we'll talk about that a little more at the end. Um, and I should say that the local forms with courts are generally available online. Like if you go to the court's website and go to the probate department, they'll, they'll, you can usually find documents. Um, it can be a little tricky. And I just wanna put it out there that if anyone here is doing them th this themselves, they're welcome to email me and my emails at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation and I can easily send you the local forms and, and point you in the right direction. Okay, so fee waiver. So like I mentioned, there's that $435 or $465 fee um, just to file your petition. And then there's also um, actually a court investigator fee because a court investigator is gonna investigate this case and there's a fee associated with that. And it varies depending on the county, but it's, it's roughly eight, $850 depending on the county. Um, and so, you know, that's a significant amount of fees right there between the two. In order to get those waived, if your child does not have any assets, then they are considered low income and they can fill out, you can, I'm sorry, you can fill out this request to waive court fees. Um, and honestly, also I should state, um, any of these forms that I talked about, you can also Google them. If you literally Google GC310, then in the Google search, petition for appointment of conservator will pop up. 
and that's, and it'll give you online access and you can, and it's actually like a fillable form. Okay. So same here, you can just Google F1001GC and the fee waiver request will come up and you're going to fill that out. If your child receives SSI, Medi-Cal or IHSS, that automatically um, qualifies them for a fee waiver. If they're not receiving anything at this time, then there's another option where you can um, state that, basically state that they are below a certain income. And then you would just have to give some quick information about their income and, and um, on a separate piece of paper that comes with it. And that's it. And that's how you would get the fees waived. Okay. Um, and with that fee waiver, you need to also submit an order on fee waiver so that the court actually issues an order stating that fees are waived. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if the individual has a special needs trust that is currently funded, meaning a special needs trust that has money in it right now, not one that's going into effect on your death, but one that right now has money in it, um, then that in that case, you cannot ask for a fee waiver because there are funds available for the individual. Okay. And that takes away their basically like their low income status. Okay. So notice of hearing. Um, this means that you need to notify certain people that this hearing is going to take place. Um, and by the way that you would do that is there is an actual document called notice of hearing that would state the date and time and place of the hearing. Um, and you would send a copy of that with a copy of the whole petition that has been filed and you would mail that to certain people. The people you're going to mail it to are the parents of the individual, unless it's you yourself and you've, you're the one doing this, then you don't need to mail it to yourself. Um, siblings of the individual, grandparents of the individual, even if they're living out of state, out of country, all these people need to receive this in the mail, or you need to at least have mailed it to them, I should say. Um, also, the regional center needs to be notified by mail. And um, the individual, the disabled individual who's being conserved needs to be notified. And then the attorney for the individual. And we'll talk about who that attorney is shortly. Um, a lot of times it's going to be the public defender, in which case you're just going to mail it to the public defender's office. And you can just do a quick Google search of the county's public defender's office to find an address for that. Um, but all these people you do need to mail this to. Um, and not, and it doesn't matter what happens once you've mailed it, whether they receive it, whether they open it and read it, that is not your issue. Your issue is that you did mail it and that you sign a form, you know, under penalty of perjury that you mailed this to these people at the addresses that you list and that you sign that and submit it to the court. Okay. Um, so that is the requirement for notice of hearing. Um, a citation, this is something that needs to be served to the individual. Um, what that means is someone actually has to walk up and personally hand them, um, oh, there's a typo, that's embarrassing, um, hand them paperwork that um, states that this hearing is taking place, okay? Um, it can't be you that does this, since you are the person who's, who is, you know, filing the petition. You have to have someone 18 or over, um, not you, that can do this. And like I said, they just need to hand paperwork to the individual. Um, it can be, a, you know, another family member who's not part of the conservatorship process. It could be a teacher, a neighbor. Um, it, it doesn't matter who it is. And that person just needs to sign a form that says where and when they serve the paperwork. And then that needs to get filed with the court. Okay, and that has to be done no more than 15 days before um, the hearing. Okay, and I always, I always do notice of hearing and the citation. I always just do them at the very beginning, right after I've filed everything and have everything back. I just get all that out of the way. Okay. Um, next is the attorney that's going to represent the individual being conserved. By law, in a limited conservatorship, the individual has a right to an attorney, um, not only a right to an attorney, but is required by law to be, um, to be represented. So the court will, um, will appoint someone. In most counties, uh, it's going to be the public defender's office. Okay, and I obviously I don't know all the counties that are here today being represented, um, but I will tell you the counties that are not the public defender, which are Contra Costa County, uh, San Mateo County, and San Francisco County. In those counties, they actually have um, pri private attorneys 
uh, that serve on panels that get appointed by the court. So for instance, I used to sit on San Francisco's panel. So it's an attorney like me, someone that does a lot of conservatorship work and know, is very familiar with conservatorship law. Um, and that would then, my job would be to visit the individual, to speak with them, figure out how much of this they understand, um, figure out if they have any opinion about this. I'm supposed to go through all the the authorities that have been requested and ask them how they feel about their mom or dad or whoever it is having that decision making authority. Obviously, in some instances, we there are nonverbal individuals that cannot cannot engage in a conversation or individuals that do not have the ability to even understand a conversation like this. And so these attorneys are very used to, you know, high functioning all the way down to nonverbal, you know, and, and low cognitive abilities. And that's, they're very used to it and they will do the best they can to ascertain what they need. Um, and then their job is basically to vocalize that opinion or lack of opinion to the court. Okay. Um, so that's, and that's how that happens. Um, I will say in Sonoma County, the one exception is, uh, in my cases at least, and I don't know if this is across the board, but the public defender doesn't generally visit the individual. Um, it's a nice gentleman na named Nate Roth. And as of for the last, I don't know, few years at least, he hasn't actually been doing um, specific visits with the individual. Um, I would imagine that if there was some type of concern or red flag raised in the case, he would. But um, for cases that you know don't have any issues, it, 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 at least in my cases, he hasn't been visiting the individuals. Okay. So the regional center has to be involved in this process. Um, they are required to prepare a report for the court. What that report does is it actually outlines, so let's say you've asked for all seven powers. Um, what the report does is it will go through each of the seven powers and it will determine whether that specific power should be granted or should remain in the hands of the individual. Um, they will generally have a meeting with you first in order to discuss the conservatorship. Um, and they, those two powers I mentioned earlier, the power to control social and sexual relationships and the power to consent or withhold consent to marriage, those powers, um, you know, are not always supported by the regional center. It, like I said, it depends on the regional center. Regional center of the East Bay does not like to support those. Uh, Golden Gate Regional Center, is, it kind of depends on the case. Um, and up in North Bay Regional Center, generally there's not as much of a conflict about that. Um, but it really depends. Um, and so if those powers are very important to you for a specific reason, then I suggest in your Regional Center meeting that you, you know, voice those concerns and make it very clear why this is necessary. Um, and then the, you know, the re regional center has to file this report with the court and you will get a copy of the report ahead of time before the hearing so that you can see what their recommendations are. Um, it's very important to understand that their recommendations are not binding on the court. The court, I mean, I have many times seen regional centers not suggest certain powers, but those powers will still be granted by the judge. So, you know, I, I don't want you to think that just because you have a regional center report come back one way that that means that that's the way the judge is going to rule. Um, it depends, it just, if you can make your case and, or your attorney can make your case and can sway the judge, then, you know, then that's great. Um, so that is the regional center's involvement. And then there's an individual called a court investigator who is job is to investigate this entire case. And what they, so this is this slide shows you what the law says they're supposed to do. I say they are doing two main things. They are deciding whether or not a conservatorship is appropriate. Um, and they are deciding whether or not you are the appropriate person to act as conservator. Those are the, really their two main things that they're doing. Um, and how are they gonna do that? They are going to do, conduct interviews. Um, Pre-COVID, this would have been in-person interviews. Um, they would have actually come to the home where the individual lives um, seen where they live, make sure they have, you know, a bed, clothes in the closet, things are clean and well kept, you know, all that kind of stuff to make sure the individual is being cared for appropriately. Um, right now, during COVID, those, all these interviews are being done remotely. Um, what that means is, in some cases, they actually, you know, you do Zoom or FaceTime or whatever it is, and you will walk around the house and show them, like, here's 
their room and here, you know, and they'll actually ask you to do that. In other cases, it's, it's not that it's just you sitting and having a video conference. Um, and, um, and they will interview you and any other proposed conservator, and they will interview the individual who's being conserved. And that interview is going to be similar to what the attorney did, where they're going to be gauging, does this individual understand conservatorship? Do they have an opinion about this? And they'll go through each of the powers with them and see if they have an opinion about, you know, the, the conservator having those powers. Same, same, similar to what the attorney did. The difference is the attorney's not there to interview you, only the court investigator is. Um, the court investigator also might interview other people. They might call, they will always call the regional center. That is across the board. Um, but then they might also call um, you know, the school or a, a, a some sort of aid or caretaker or something like that also. It just depends on their capacity and, and, how, and their caseload. In some cases, in some counties, the caseloads are very, very high and they do not have enough court investigators. Um, and they just, you know, they do the best they can. Um, they are going to run a background check on you. They are going to, um, yeah, that's what they're going to do. And then they're going to file a report. They're going to write out a very detailed report of their interviews. Um, and you will get a copy of that report ahead of time so that you know how things look. And the idea of that report is to help the judge. I mean, the judge isn't the one who's, you know, going out and doing all the legwork here, right? So the idea of the report is for the judge to have an idea of whether this is a good idea, whether the conservator is the right person, all that kind of stuff. Okay, the hearing. Um, so right now, as I mentioned, hearings are not happening in person. Uh, they are either phone or uh, video, depending on the county. Um, so before the hearing, you are required to give your order to the court so that, it, that they can review it and make sure it looks good and then they'll be able to sign it. Um, then your letters of conservatorship, you're going to want to have prepared ahead of time. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then there is a video that almost all counties require that you watch. Sonoma does not. Um, but there is a video that you're required to watch. And in that video, um, it's you can Google, I put the name of the video here, you can Google it. It's really, really bad. Um, it was made a really long time ago, which makes it fun to see the cool fashion statements and stuff, but um, it's not entirely helpful, but it is required. It's like a 24 minute video, I think. And then a lot of um, counties have some sort of form that you're supposed to sign that states that you have watched this video, okay? Um, okay, so do you need to be at the hearing? In most counties, yes. Most counties require that you and your child appear at the hearing. I did talk earlier about, you know, if your child has severe anxiety and this is going to flip them out, then, you know, it's possible that between the doctor stating that they shouldn't be there and between the attorney who's representing them, if the attorney is okay with them not being there and is okay with stating to the court that they are waiving their appearance and that they don't need to be there, then that's a, that's a possibility, okay? Um, but, you know, otherwise everyone needs to be there. Um, you know, if you do have an attorney, you won't really be doing anything or saying much. Um, the attorney will do the talking and there's generally, unless there's something that needs to be addressed, um, generally it's just more of a formality that everyone needs to be there and that, you know, in order for the judge to be able to grant the conservatorship. Um, Sonoma, um, actually is what the only court right now that is not required, well, I don't know across the board, but in my cases is not requiring that people show up. Um, you can look the day before online and they will let you know if um, your matter has been pre-granted, it's called, basically granted ahead of time. Um, and then you don't actually have to be um, part of the hearing itself. But all other places, you know, all the counties are requiring that everyone be there. Um, <laughs> okay. Hopefully you guys are hanging in there. We're getting close to the end. This is a lot of talking, I know. Uh, what happens at the hearing? So generally speaking, uh, like I said, the attorney will do most of the talking. If not, it'll be you and the judge may have some questions. Um, if, if everything in the reports have looked good and there's no issues and the other attorney is on board with everything, then you know there probably won't be any real questions. Uh, and then the judge will sign the order. And then, you know, what you would, what, what would happen is you would go to the filing window where you filed all your documents with your order and your letters of conservatorship. Um, right now, you know, a lot of 
courthouses don't want people in there. So, you know, a lot of this can be done by mail. Um, so let's see. And letters of conservatorship, this is the golden ticket that you're going for. Um, this will be what you show to doctors, to the regional center, to you know, schools, whatever it is, to show that you are the conservator and you have certain authorities. Um, and so you want to get, you know, a copy of this from the court. You're going to want to get something called a certified copy. You have, um, there is a 25 fish dollar fee. It depends on the county. I think some counties are up to like $50 now. Um, but if you have a fee waiver on file that we talked about earlier, then you don't have to have, um, uh, then you don't have to have it. Okay. I just want to make sure we're still doing, we're all doing good. Yes. Thumbs up, Erica. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, da, 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 da. certified copy. Yeah. If you lose your certified copy, yes, you can get another one from the court. So you don't need to worry about that too much. Um, okay. After the hearing. So now the judge has issued your order, signed it. You've gotten your order from the court. You've gotten your letters of conservatorship. You're done, but you're not quite done. Um, you actually, there are a few documents that need to be filed after the hearing. Um, I've put them here. Two of them, these first two, the notice of conservatees rights and the determination of care, those are both in that same database I showed you earlier, or you can just Google them. Um, and the notice of rights is something, it's just, you just have to mail the, the notice of rights, the document itself with a copy of the order, you have to mail it to the same family members that you mailed the petition to and um, to the attorney that's representing the individual. Um, and then you need to fill out a form that says that you mailed it to these people and file that with the court. And then the determination of care is a very simple document that just you just need to fill out, you know, how many hours of assistance the individual needs with things like household chores and, you know, daily living skills and things like that. Um, and then, you know, you need to file that with the court. And then most counties have a general plan. Um, Sonoma does not. And Sonoma does not. I think Sonoma is the only one that does not. I think all other, maybe Contra Costa does not also actually. Um, but all other counties have a general plan, their own form that you need to fill out that is more a more detailed look at the care that the individual needs. Um, and you would you need to fill that out and file that as well. Um, and once you filed all those documents after your hearing is over, then you really are done. And now you move on to what happens next um, with my conservatorship. Well, a limited conservatorship lasts for your lifetime, not the lifetime of the individual who's been conserved. Because once there's no conservator in place, then you, you know, there's no one to provide the care for the individual. So it lasts for your lifetime. Um, the other way it can be terminated is if the court determines that it's no longer necessary. Um, so the court is actually going to review your case every so often. There's generally speaking, the rule is after the first year. And then every two years thereafter, um, it kind of varies court to court. It varies based on their rules. And it also varies based on their, their capacity. Like I said, some courts do not have enough court investigators. Um, and so they do reviews at when they can. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, rule of thumb is after the first year and every two years after that. And what the individual, it, it might not be the same court investigator that you had for, through this process, um, and they, same thing, you know, they're supposed to pre COVID come to your home, check on everything, make sure everything's going well, or visit the home where the individual's living, um, talk to you, have an interview with you and just make sure that everything's going okay. And, um, and, um, you know, right now, obviously that's all being done again, remotely. Um, and then they'll write up a report just stating what they found, um, you know, that everything's going okay and blah, blah, blah. And then they'll file that with the court. Um, and let's see, um, oh, so, and like I said, the court can terminate a conservatorship. Um, if for some reason during one of their reviews, it just seems like this isn't necessary anymore, they can terminate it. I've never seen that happen. Um, the other way is if you determine that it's no longer necessary, and I have seen that happen. I have worked with clients who asked me to terminate conservatorships, um, because, you know, like I had a client whose daughter had just progressed so much and she was living independently and attending college and, you know, it just, she, she didn't want to be conserved anymore and her mom agreed. So things like there, you know, you can take this to court and ask for it to be um, terminated, but you would have to show, you know, significant reason why, why that is, why it's no longer necessary. Um, and then if you do have a conservatorship of the estate, 
I'll just say this quickly in case anyone on here has that situation where um, you are managing finances, you have to report to the court after the first year and every two years thereafter and a very detailed accounting. And there's a very specific way that you have to do it. And for that, you would need an attorney. Um, well, I guess you wouldn't technically, but I don't know that you would be able to do it on your own. Um, and you have to show them how the money has been spent um, and they have to actually approve what you've been doing with the money. So that's something to consider. And that's why conservatorships of the estate are not um, always ideal because it, it, you know, there's a lot of court supervision. Um, and then just one thing to note is if anyone moves, if you move or if the individual moves, you need to notify the court. You're technically supposed to notify them before the move and after the move. Um, there are forms, which I've put here, which you can Google and find. Um, and you know, you do need to let the court know when, when people have moved, especially because they're supposed to come and visit, like I said, every so often. Okay, so now how do I prepare for down the road? All right, so this is the end, just so you know, the end is near. Um, some of this is conservatorship uh, related and some is not. So first of all, the first thing on here is nominating a successor. So we did talk earlier about having co-conservators um, and some people go that route so that there'll be an easy transition. Other people choose to just have the parents, for instance, be the conservators, but then they do have some sort of document that states um, you know, when something happens to them that they want so-and-so to be conservator. Something very important to understand about the conservatorship process is if you have a document and you have stated that you want someone to take over when you can no longer do it, that does not just put that person in charge. That person then needs to go to court and do a similar process to what we just walked through um, to be appointed conservator by the court. And they would have that documentation though as part of their petition to show that they are the intended person, okay? Um, it's a slightly different process because the conservatorship is already in place. So they're not investigating whether it's necessary, but it is a similar process with a lot of the same forms. Um, so that's something important to understand. Um, and so your options are either at some point have a co-conservator brought on with you or have a document that states who you want to have take over. And then that individual would be in charge at the time that it's necessary to go to court and put themselves um, in, in the conservatorship, in a conservator position, okay? So now these last two things do not have anything to do with conservatorship. These are completely separate from conservatorship, um, but they are two things that I always like to throw out there because I think they're very important for everybody to know. The first is that um, if you are leaving any money to your child um, on your death and you want them to continue to receive public benefits, then you cannot leave money directly to them. You know, SSI has a $2,000 income threshold or a $2,000 resource, I should say, threshold. Any one such anyone has more than $2,000, that triggers ineligibility, okay? That triggers them to potentially lose benefits. Um, so what that means is you would need to leave the inheritance to a special needs trust, which will be available for the needs of the individual, but would not, would not affect their eligibility for public benefits, okay? The way it works very briefly, and this could be a whole workshop of its own, so I'm just gonna give you a very brief understanding, is you have a trustee who's in charge of the, the assets in the trust, and that trustee can pay for things that the individual needs, such as, you know, therapies, aids, um, you know, things that the, that individual needs um, can be paid for from the trust, but the individual, him or herself, doesn't have access to the money in there. And because that he or she can't control the money, therefore it's not their own resource for purposes of eligibility for public benefits. Okay, so that's something super important to understand. And if you are putting together an estate plan for yourself, a will or a trust to direct what happens on your death with your money, you're going to want to make sure you work with an attorney that knows about special needs trusts so that you can leave your share for your child with a disability um, into a special needs trust. And then the second thing I want to talk about are ABLE accounts. Um, and just very quickly, a lot of people aren't familiar yet with ABLE accounts. Um, Obama signed this into legislation um, and it took a while for them to get up and running. It's a tax sheltered savings account for individuals with a disability. 
the, it's basically like a, you know, like a 529 college plan. Those are called a 529C. This is called a 529A. So it's, it works in this, in a similar fashion as a college savings plan. Um, but this is specific to individuals with disabilities. The money does need to be used for specific things such as, um, basically it's anything that is necessary when you are living a life with a disability. It's a pretty broad standard. Um, but um, what the benefit of this is, is you can save in this tax sheltered savings account up to $100,000 without um, affecting the individual's public benefits eligibility. So it's a pretty huge thing here. There are a lot of you know, rules around it and, and restrictions, one of which is you cannot put more than $15,000 into it a year. Um, but you know, I'm not going to get in the nitty gritty of these accounts, but it's something to definitely look into. Um, uh, I've, what I've done here is I've put two websites. The one on the bottom is ablenrc.org. That's the ABLE National Resource Center. It's a really, really useful website. They, have, they give webinars all the time. Um, it's, it, they, it's really useful in teaching you about ABLE accounts. Um, and then the 10 things to know, uh, that is on their website. It's a specific link to a really easy video to watch that just gives you a very clear, quick overview of ABLE accounts. Okay, so those are the two things I really want you to walk away with besides just conservatorship. Um, this is the end. This is me. Here's my information. I'm going to leave this up here for a moment so you can write it down. Or as we said earlier, you can download this whole presentation if you didn't already. It was in your Zoom link email. Um, and again, if you have questions about any of the local court rules or anything or documents or you can't find something, you're welcome to email me and I can help you.